Greetings, everyone. It's Professor Fiore. Today, we're going to take a look at a single supply inverting op amp configuration. So let's start with a fairly simple, straightforward, sort of a kind of a dual supply version of this. This is something you've seen before, undoubtedly. I've drawn this a little bit upside down. I usually put the minus uh, inverting terminal at the top, but I flipped it simply because the second circuit we're going to look at, it's just a little, little easier to see that way along with these power supplies. In any case, we've got standard plus and minus 15 volt DC power supplies on our little op amp. Um, this is a BiFET TL081, pretty uh, standard, popular little op amp, second generation. Uh, feedback, we've got a 2K resistor for the uh, input. That's going to, of course, set our input impedance at 2K and a feedback resistor of 8.2K. So the gain of this is RF over RI, 8.2K over 2K for a gain of 4.1 inverting. Now I'm, I'm applying a one kilohertz, 500 millivolt peak signal, nice little sine wave. So we should get 4.1 times that, or just a smidge over two volts peak sitting out here at the load. All right, fairly straightforward, nothing too magical. So let's just go through here um, we'll take a look at the transient analysis, see what we get. So we're going to draw the excitation. Uh, I've got two milliseconds of difference here. Just see a couple of cycles. All right, let's get our um, legend on here. So you can see here's the VN is the green one. And as we expected, um, you know, 500 millivolts. So that's, you know, right there looking good. We can see the inversion. The red is the output, the load voltage. And as I said, you know, we were expecting um, somewhere around two volts, two volts ish. You know, we can double check this with a little bit more accuracy here. Just grab the peak. So you can see we're just over two volts. All right. That looks really good. Now the question becomes, I want to make a single supply version of this op amp. So we looked at this with the non-inverting version. How do we do it with the inverting version? Well, it's similar. Um, once again, we need to set this up with a sort of a bias halfway between. Remember, you can't just ground, let's say the negative power supply pin, right? If you just grounded pin four over here, then you, know, you get an amplifier that's also a half wave rectifier. That's not really what we want, right? You have no room on the bottom end, on the negative end to swing. So instead, we have to bias this. In other words, bring it up toward the middle somewhere. So we can still deal with a, a full 30 volt differential for the power, a single 30 volt power supply. So here's that same circuit slightly modified for a single power supply. So I've got a 30 volt DC supply. Pin four is grounded. However, and this is very important, notice what we've done on the non-inverting terminal. We've thrown in a pair of 100K resistors. This is just going to set a voltage divider. Given this 30 volt source, we're going to, we expect about 15 volts DC here, right? So we add coupling capacitors to this to block DC out. When we look at V out op amp, um, we're going to see that 15 volts, that DC 15 volts sitting out here. So we don't want to run that out into the load. So we need an output capacitor. Similar sort of situation on the input and uh, as we mentioned in the other video, we probably want to make sure that this um, non-inverting input, pin 3 over here, is a good AC ground as far as noise, any noise that sits on the power supply. I want to shunt that to ground. So that's what this little bypass capacitor is doing over here. We're guaranteeing this is a, uh, a good AC ground point. Now you think about that for a sec. Any noise that would be out here on the power supply, you could imagine that as a little AC source that's feeding in here. That creates a divider. There's a voltage divider between R1 and this impedance. And at the frequencies you're interested, and in this particular case, this would be any audio frequency, uh, this impedance is much, much smaller than R1, right? Because the uh, X sub C of this capacitor is going to be much smaller than 100K. So it basically brings this point to a virtual ground, a very, very low value. And all of the noise signal, this higher frequency, maybe ripple or some other kind of noise that's on the power supply, really gets dropped across to R1, right? It doesn't actually get into the non-inverting input of the amplifier, right? Now, these capacitors create 
lower frequency limits on the amplifier. So how do we calculate those? Are they a problem? What's the deal? Very simply, uh, you can establish a lower frequency limit with this input pair, this input coupling cap and RI, because this does establish the input impedance of the amplifier, right? You just use one over two pi RC to find that critical frequency, right? So one over two pi times the 2K times the one micro, and you'll get something around 80 hertz for these particular values, right? The one micro and the 2K. Um, on the output, C out, you know, the thevenized impedance around that is basically our load. You know, looking back into the op amp, um, that's ideally zero for an output impedance. So you basically see two micro and 10K. You do the same uh, calculation there, and you find out that this is about 10 times lower Right. In other words, this is around 8 hertz. And as far as uh, the noise frequency that we would get over here, this has nothing to do with the input signal. Right. This is just shunting the noise. You would thevenize from the bypass cap looking back, which would be 100K, then this 100K. Ideally, the power supply is ground. So you've got 100K in parallel with 100K, which is 50K. So you get a 50 and a 10. That's going to give you a sub 1 hertz critical frequency. So... You know, this little amplifier, because our, our input limit is 80 hertz, this would be fine for something like voice. You know, human voice doesn't really go much below 80 hertz. Um, for music, you know, you're, you're losing a couple of the bottom octaves, so maybe not so good. But that's not really our point here, right? I'm not trying to make a high-quality audio amplifier necessarily. But you can just, you know, vary these capacitor values. All right, so... Let's do a little analysis here and see what we get. We should see out here, um, again, this, this half power supply, this 15 volts DC. So the feedback resistors, 8.2K, 2K, those are the same. So I still should get this inverting gain of, of uh, you know, 4.1. And I have that same 500 millivolt input signal, one kilohertz. So we should see around two volts peak again coming out for a signal. That's what we would see at V load. At V out op amp, we're going to see that riding on the 15 volt bias. Alrighty, so let's take a look at that. We'll do a little uh, transient analysis again. Same deal. See what we get. Okay, I'll get the uh, legend over here. So our V in, this little guy, as we saw before. So this is really what we saw last time. Right, the, the uh, dark red over here, the maroonish, is V load. So we see the inversion. We get the signal that we expect to see. You know, we can, we can just double check that real quick, like. Come up to the peak. You know, again, there's just a smidge over two volts as we expected. Um, up here, right, this guy, this green thing, that's V out of the op amp. And what do we see? Well, we see the identical AC signal that we see at the load, but... Right? It's offset. It's offset about 15 volts, which is the bias. Right? So, beautiful. All we have to do is just set up this little divider, ground the negative power supply, put the positive power supply over here. We can use double the voltage because it's the total differential that matters to the op amp. Right? Plus or minus 15, it sees the same as 0 to 30. We just have to bias it so that we have room, so to speak, for the negative signals. All right, now, as I mentioned, there are some uh, critical frequencies that are created by these coupling caps, and we have to design the circuit in such a way that, you know, those critical frequencies are, are below what we're trying to pass here as far as input signal. So let's do um, a Bode plot, basically, right? And Tina Ti, that's an AC transfer characteristic. I'm going to run this from 1 hertz up to 10 kilohertz. And... As I said, we would expect 80 hertz for the input network and 8 hertz for the output network. Okay, so let's take a look at this. We need a legend here. So, um, the green is the V out of the op amp, in other words, right here. So basically what this is, is the response of the op amp itself... In other words, back to the original circuit that we had, which goes down to DC because there's no coupling caps inside the op amp. There's no lower frequency limit, right? That's a distinguishing characteristic of an op amp circuit is that there's no lower frequency limit. It goes down to DC. 
you could say it's zero hertz if you wanted to but basically there's no lower frequency limit in other words this thing would just go out straight boom okay um oh and by the way as long as we're looking at this all right the amplitude on this should be just about 12 db gain of four is going to be 12 db and that's exactly what we see here right there's 10 11 12 right there beautiful okay now i just i'm just going to grab a little thing here just to verify that real quick like so there you go 12 and a quarter db for our gain of 4.1 looking good now we have a nice straight line here this because it's v out of op amp does not include this critical frequency it's only this front end critical frequency which we said is going to be around 8 hertz so you know critical frequency is 3 db down well we were sitting over here at 12 so we're looking for you know somewhere in the you know nine and a quarter or something like that all right and look there you go there's our 80 hertz okay that's the critical frequency for the input network now if we take uh another guy over here zinc and come over here and look at the output at the load rather than the output of the op amp output at the load this includes the critical frequency on the input and the critical frequency on this output coupling cap as well. So we can see that this thing is going a bit faster. All right. Now, as we mentioned, that should be about 8 hertz. So if I come down, if that's accurate, if my calculation is accurate, and I come down here to, you know, somewhere around 8 hertz, and I'll just park it around here. And now I take the output one, the, the, the uh, maroon colored one, I bring it to the same frequency. If in fact that's also 8 hertz, there should be about a 3 decibel difference between those two. And in fact, that's exactly what we see, right? We see a, a negative roughly 7.7 .7 and roughly negative 10.7. So that is in fact the critical frequency of C out and our load, right? So this maroon is the net response all right, we got that nice 20 dB per decade roll off here. We start with that, but then the output network kicks in. And if we check the slope on this, it's going to be twice that. In other words, 40 dB per decade or 12 dB per octave. Okay. Beautiful. And there we have it. So in recap, all we have to do is ground the negative power supply. We can use twice the power supply voltage on the positive. Then we add a voltage divider, just a simple one-to-one -one voltage divider. In this case, I'm just using 100Ks because it's convenient. I would add the little bypass capacitor over here, which is there just to uh, shunt away any noise that would be in the power supply. All right? Nice little no lo a lower noise, uh, ripple, things like that, little addition. Um, and then finally, input and output coupling caps so that the DC doesn't go back and affect, you know, the outside world, so to speak. You know, maybe this is a, you know, some little transducer out here. Um, this load doesn't want to see the DC. So that's what we include. We just have to remember that these two caps in particular are going to insert these lead networks, roll off the low frequency performance. So we have to design that with an appropriate capacitor, given our desired low frequency, and whatever the associated resistances are, right? So if you're designing, you take that one over two pi RC equation and you solve it in this case in terms of C, right? In other words, C is equal to one over two pi FR. So you plug in your desired lower frequency, the associated resistor, and that'll tell you what the cap has to be. Typically, we would make one of these dominant. In this case, I made the input dominant simply because it's the smaller resistor and that would give me a, a, a more modest capacitor size, okay? All right, beautiful. See you next time.